Well, good morning, good morning. It is good to see all of you. Just it's so exciting to hear voices and excitement and just energy in the room. So it's good to see you all. And for those of you who watched later or live stream or just once it's posted, you guys are welcome as well. We're glad to have you along for our journey through Mark. So today we, we covered a lot, didn't we? we? There was a lot of verses this week. So we're going to try to kind of break those down a little bit, take it a little piece at a time, unpack it. So let me pray for us, and then we will we'll get to it this morning. Here we go. Lord, thank you for bringing us all here. Thank you for slightly cooler weather in the mornings. God, we're grateful for just a reminder that you truly are the creator, and you are in control of the seasons, and the weather does things, and, and the stars, and the moon, and the sun do things because you say they should, and you've created a, a place for us to live in, and you care deeply about it, and you care deeply about us. So we're thankful that we serve a God like that. Holy Spirit, would you lead and guide us this morning as we process through this part of Mark and as we kind of explore uh, some longer passages? God, would you give us wisdom? We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we're, we're moving on in Jesus' journey. We're moving on in how he is teaching and preaching. Remember, telling a good news story, all the things we've been talking about for a while. And we're going to continue seeing that today. So let's just jump right in. Take a look at, we're going to finish up Mark chapter 2 and then do Mark chapter 3 as well. So we have right off the bat two stories at the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. Again, remember, Mark is writing and telling a story. He is putting together a cohesive unit of a story. So he has ordered things so that we get two Sabbath stories smacked right next to each other. That might be important. It might be important that we're seeing two stories about the Sabbath, two stories about Jesus kind of confronting and changing um, people's ideas, people's concepts, people's visions of how things should be right next to each other. So that's important. If you see similar themes kind of getting smacked next to each other, it's good Bible study practice for us to kind of pay attention to that. So let's look at that starting in chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and, his, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some of the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, is it really loud to y'all? Or is it just me? It's just like, it's just the echo in the room. It's just really loud. He answered, have you, have you never read when David did this, when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, David entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only to priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even on the Sabbath. That's a weird story. Let's just acknowledge that's a little bit of a weird story, right? So let's, let's break that down. Jesus and his disciples are on a long walk. And they get a little hungry and they want some trail mix. That's essentially what's going on here, right? It's like at some point, if you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews and you've ever been around little people, like you know that at some point the four-year-old is going to say, oh, can I have a snack, right? So you get hungry as you're on this journey. So Jesus' disciples, they're grown men, but they're no different. They get hungry. If you're married, you know this. Those men get hangry sometimes, right? So anyways, they get a little hungry and it happens to be the Sabbath, which on the Sabbath, you don't do any harvesting, you don't do any grain picking. You don't do any of that stuff because that's work. Um, but they're walking through this field. And so they start picking off the little kind of heads of grain on, on the stalks. And they're, they're kind of nibbling on these. It's the OG trail mix. It's very, very, uh, you know, organic, probably not gluten-free if it's grain. But, you know, they're, they're healthy in some ways, I guess. And so they're eating this. And somehow the, the, the powers that be find out about this. I'm unclear on this point. Like, are they stalking them a little bit? Is it more than just his disciples on this journey? Not quite sure. But somehow the Pharisees get a bee in their bonnet about this, right? They're like, hey, we love to, to make sure that people keep the Sabbath. We're very protective of it. And we've received word that your disciples are working on the Sabbath because they're, they're picking grain, right? And then Jesus literally goes way out to left field, which this is left field for y'all. That's right field for me. That was backwards, but I did it intentionally. And that was impressive. <laughs> uh, he goes way out to left field. And he's like, let me tell you the story about David. <laughs> that has absolutely nothing to do with the Sabbath. <laughs> nothing to do with the Sabbath. So that begs the question, why is Jesus using this story? It's, 
Again, draw good Bible study practice. We're seeing, okay, what illustration is Jesus using? Does it make sense? Does it not make sense? If it doesn't make sense on the surface, what is he actually doing? Because this is confusing. So Jesus tells this story about how when David was kind of fleeing from some of his enemies, David did that a lot in the Old Testament, and he's running away, boop, 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 and he's got his people with him, and they get hungry. Again, another story about getting hungry on a journey. We're, we need that trail mix. We need those granola bars. And so David goes into the house of God where they have the Ark of the Covenant, where they have kind of the tabernacle kind of set up-ish. They don't have the temple yet. David's still alive. Solomon hasn't built the temple yet. But he goes to where they're keeping the things of God, where they would go for worship. And in that place, uh, you have this consecrated bread, right, that only the priests are supposed to eat. It's there for like ritualistic type purposes. Joe Schmo off the street doesn't come in and just eat that bread. Like that's, that's no, no. And if you read the Old Testament, it seems that God is usually pretty concerned about the things that are in God's house, right? You have that story in the Old Testament too of when they're transporting the Ark of the Covenant and that guy who has really good intentions, the Ark's starting to fall and he reaches out and touches it and God strikes him dead, right? So it's not good to mess with the things in the house of God. But David goes in there and they have like a Panera Bread experience just kicking it in the house of God, eating this consecrated bread that they're not supposed to eat. Again, but this story has nothing to do with Sabbath. It has nothing to do with, with the, what the disciples have done. They're not picking grain. They're not breaking Sabbath law. So what is Jesus getting at? What is Jesus getting at? I would argue, and, and, and other biblical scholars much smarter than I am argue, that, that what Jesus is doing here is not so much making an argument for, for defending what his disciples did, as he is drawing a very strong connection between David and himself. And this is key. This is key. Just as David was able to, to still be faithful to God and to still lead God's people and to still do all these great things, and yet in some instances go against what was considered the norm, so too Jesus will be doing that, which is a big deal because they've been waiting for someone like David. They've been waiting for a great Davidic king. They've been waiting for something from that stump of Jesse, David's dad, that, that stump of David's family that's kind of been hacked to pieces by the exile, hacked to pieces in the Old Testament. We don't have a king on the throne. They are waiting and longing for someone like David, for someone from David's line to rise up and do something about their plight. And so what Jesus is doing here is both offering us a lesson and reminding us, hey, the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath, and, and the Son of Man, who Jesus, that's Jesus' favorite way to talk about himself, and we're gonna talk about that more as we go through Mark, is Lord even on the Sabbath? Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna draw some pretty strong connections between myself and David, pay attention. This is what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is saying, hey, David did something kinda similar, I'm doing something similar, so pay attention. Does that make sense? David, or Jesus is drawing very strong connections between David and himself. And David's a big deal. David's a big deal. He's right up there with like Moses and Abraham. Like you, you invoke one of those three names and you're doing something really important. That's a good, other great Bible study tip. If you're reading the Gospels especially and you see Jesus or someone invoke Abraham, David, or, or Elijah or someone like that, pay attention because they're, they're saying something really important about their understanding of God, about their understanding of what we call the Old Testament, about their understanding of the story of God. If you get one of those, you're dealing with something big. So Jesus is saying, hey, I'm here and I'm doing something not unlike David, who David was and what David did, so pay attention, pay attention. We then get another story of him healing someone on the Sabbath, starting in chapter three. I'm not gonna read all of it, but you get this guy, he has something wrong with his hand, Jesus heals him, and the Pharisees are infuriated at this. Right, because Jesus is doing work, he's doing something, he's creating change on the Sabbath. This is, this is a no-no to them, right? The Sabbath is very near and dear to their hearts. And, and understand, the Pharisees get a really bad rap from us. And, and if we're honest, like, they're, just, they're just doing what they're supposed to do in some ways. Like they're trying to keep the law, they've kind of stumbled along the way. But again, they're, they're dealing with almost this, I, I sense like an anxiousness in them, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for God to show up, for God to do something, for God to move in their midst, for God's Davidic king to co finally come to bear. And so they're trying to keep everything right because they're like, if we could just keep things kosher, literally here, maybe God will do something. 
So if we can just hold down the fort, if we can just keep things moving along, follow the law, follow the Torah, if we can just get our act together, maybe God would come and do something. And I mean, we're pretty much the exact same way, right? We think in our brains, like if I could just kind of clean this up, get my act together, make things work, figure this out, then, then God will do something. And the gospel is completely contrary to that because Jesus just shows up right in the midst of their mess and says, here I am, <laughs> surprise. And so Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath and he asks them, hey, is it, is it lawful um, to do good or evil or to save life or to kill on the Sabbath? So Jesus is reframing their understanding of their laws. Jesus is reframing the understanding of what it looks like when God erupts in their midst. He's reframing their understanding of what it looks like when the Davidic king comes and their brains are spinning, right? I mean, our brains probably spun a little bit while we read some of this this week because it was long and it's kind of had some confusing things, but their, their brains are just exploding because God is doing something new. And just like Lee talked about last week at the end of chapter two as well, where you get that illustration of the new wine and the new wineskins and the old wineskins that cannot contain new wine. Something has to change in us and, and by God's grace in us for us to receive the new things God is doing. The Pharisees are the classic example of someone trying to pour new wine into an old wineskin. It bursts their brains. <laughs> they cannot hold it. They cannot contain it. We have to be transformed and have a new understanding of what God is doing if we're going to contain what Jesus has done and what God still is doing for us even now in the, in, in the year 2022. We have to let God continually form us and give us new eyes, new hearts, new ears, new minds to contain what God is doing. And the Pharisees don't have this yet. So they're, they're, they're bursting like those old wineskins trying to contain this new revelation of God. Keep looking, Jesus, in verse 7 of chapter 3, we get all these crowds, right? They're just following Jesus, these masses of people, to the point that Jesus is like, okay, I got to get on a boat and like push away from the, the shore a little bit so I can get some space. And let me tell you, as an introvert who really likes to have about at least a three-foot radius around me at all times, that sounds great. <laughs> Like that is my ideal situation where I'm like, okay, I got at least a little bit of a body of water between me and people. Like that sounds great, right? And Jesus is like, okay, if I'm going to be effective and actually have the ability to speak and to, to interact with people, I gotta, we got to have some, some organization, some order here. So take a look starting at verse 10 of chapter 3. So he's in the boat. He's, they're, they're kinda, he's trying to figure out a way to make, keep, this, keep this from getting out of hand. And he says, for he had healed many. So that those with diseases are pushing forward to touch him. Again, let me, let me say this. I said this a few weeks ago. Jesus is continually, continually in positions and in places that would terrify us. I mean, can you imagine being in a place where a bunch of people with diseases are pushing forward to touch you? <laughs> like, we've, we've come through 2020. Like, that's a, that's a hard no. Like, I'll take a pass on that. Thank you, no thank you. And Jesus is just right there in the middle of it, and he's healing these people. And then we get, not only is he physically healing people, he is spiritually healing people and setting people free, not only from physical infirmities and physical ailments, but also from spiritual, just being bound up in forces of evil. And he says in verse 11, when the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. But he gave them strict orders to not tell others about him. Here is a key, key, key thing to unlocking Mark's gospel. You ready? I'm giving, like, this is just answers to the test, like straight up. Pay attention in Mark when Jesus is identified as the son of God. So pay attention to when it happens and pay attention to who is identifying him. We've already seen this, we've already seen this once in chapter one. You remember at Jesus' baptism, the heavens open up and we hear the voice of the Father say, this is my son. Listen to him, right? So you have, in chapter one, you have, you have the divine voice, you have the voice of the Father with the presence of the Spirit and the Son, you have the whole Trinity there, and the Father says, this is my son. So you have Jesus identified as the son of God in chapter one. We see it again here in chapter three, verse 11, when an impure spirit says, hey, you are the son of God. And Jesus says, shh. <laughs> Jesus literally just shushes like an unclean demon. And he's like, shh. That's impressive. 
Like, we, that makes us really uncomfortable sometimes when we think about this because we live in a Western society that really loves to kind of make things really sciencey and just kind of explain things away. Um, this is a reality, but like, this isn't, this isn't just fake, right? Like, we, we actually struggle against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is what Paul tells us later in the New, in the New Testament. And Jesus literally just tells the demon, he goes, shh, <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. And we're just very like, yes, that's exactly what happened. That should blow our minds. That Jesus has power over all these evil forces that have bound up humanity and bound up communities and bound up people for millennia. And Jesus just comes on the scene and they're like, you are the son of God. What do you want us to do? (laughs) That's crazy. That's crazy. And so we see this again in chapter 3. We're going to see it again in chapter 5. We're going to see it again in chapter 9. We're going to see it in chapter 15. And in chapter 8, you get, you, that's where we're going to get Peter saying, hey, you're the son of God. So pay attention as we go through Mark. Who is identifying Jesus as, as the son of God? Why are they? Like, what's the situation? And what is this individual or this entity's relation to God? The demons are totally not on team Jesus. They're, they're not. They're anti God's kingdom. They're anti everything Jesus is doing. But they recognize who he is. And they confess a true element of who he is. And he still tells them, hey, not yet. Not yet. Now, why is Jesus telling, telling people, both the people that he heals, and they're like, oh, I'm going to tell everyone about what you've done. And Jesus is like, don't tell anyone yet. And he tells the demons here, and he tells other people later on, when they confess him as Lord, or when they confess him as the Son of God, or when they want to share about what he's doing, why is Jesus telling them to be quiet? Like, we're kind of trained, like, we have great commission in our brains, hopefully. Um, We're kind of trained to go and tell people. Like, open your mouth. Tell people about what Jesus has done. If someone asks you a question and you're telling them about Jesus and they're like, I want to do that, you don't go, shh. Like, that's not not where we're at. So why is Jesus doing this? Here's here's the reality. The Jews of the day, and and here's a fancy word for you, the intertestamental period. That means between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the inter, the in between, the intertestamental period was a long time, several hundred years, and a lot of history happened in that. Do you, do you guys realize? I'm gonna kind of set up a history lesson for us, and some of you, I've already lost some of you. Hang with me. If you didn't like history in high school, I'm about to make it real interesting. So just hang with me, okay? Do you realize, uh, friends, that that people like Alexander the Great, people like uh, Plato, they they predated Jesus. We realize this, right? Like Alexander the Great happened before Jesus, which is why you have, you know, Greek culture and stuff like that, right? Uh, Plato, the great philosopher, uh, happened before Jesus. So you have all of this history happening right before, before the birth of Jesus, in between all the, the, the Old and New Testament. And during that time, and even back in the Old Testament, the Jews began to kind of formulate some ideas and some concepts about what God was going to do for them through their Messiah, through this Davidic king that was going to come, through maybe the, the, the reinstitution of a, of a better, more righteous type of priesthood. They had all these expectations. They had all these hopes and all these dreams and all these like visions of what God was going to do. So you have titles like Son of God or like Christ or like Messiah that are very true of Jesus, absolutely. Absolutely. But they also, in the Jewish mindset of the day, had come to mean something very different than what Jesus was going to do. They had come to mean something like someone who's going to come into Rome as a conquering war hero and decimate our enemies and set up a literal throne somewhere in Jerusalem and reinstitute the priesthood and reinstitute the sacrificial system appropriately and the spirit of God is going to fill the temple and it's going to be great because our great king has decimated our enemies through war and through violence and through all of these things. And Jesus is saying, no. (laughs) Again, new wine, old wineskins. We're seeing how Jesus is constantly changing what it looks like to be the Son of God, to be the Messiah, to be the Christ. Jesus says, no, I'm actually going to, I'm going to come in and I'm going to destroy your enemy. uh, But the enemy that you don't know you need destroyed is death. The Romans are not your ultimate enemy. Are they your enemy? Yes. But the enemy you need me to most deal with is the enemy of death and sin. So that's what I'm going to deal with. Again, spoiler alert, that's what he does at the end of Mark. Hopefully that's not a surprise. If it is... That's fine, but spoiler alert, Jesus is going to deal with that at the end of Mark. And so Jesus accepts these kind of titles. Is he the son of God? Absolutely. Is he the Messiah? Yes. Is he the Christ? Yes. But he's like, shh, because you don't have the new wineskin yet to, to, to contain what I'm about to do. 
You have old mindsets. So if you start running around telling everyone that the Messiah or the Son of God is here, they're going to expect anarchy. <laughs> the people are going to expect riots and uprisings. And Jesus is saying, nope, that's not, that's not what I'm about. That's not what the kingdom of God's about right now. I'm not going to do that. So he's having to reframe and retrain people to understand who he is and what he's about. This is why he tells people, shh. Jesus then moves on to appoint the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples. Those words kind of get interchanged in our vocabulary, and that's okay. Uh, apostle has a little bit of a different distinction. But for our, for our purposes, just generally here, we'll just call them the disciples. We know what we're talking about, the 12. Um, he appoints the 12. He gathers these, these 12 men together, and he, and he gives them uh, power. But he appoints them for a reason. So let's talk about that for a second. Verse 14 he gathers, he, he gathers the ones he wants. He appointed the 12. Here's why. That they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And guess what? We're going to see the apostles or the disciples do all of these things in just a few chapters. Jesus lets them have a trial run <laughs> like a few times while he's still on earth, which is just a kindness, I think. He's like, okay, I'm going to hang back here. You guys go, like, do your assignment for the day. Like, go out two by two or three or however. Go, go proclaim the gospel. Go, go meet people in their sin and in their captivity to sin and cast out those demons. Go, go preach. Go do all these things. And then come back and tell me how it went, right? Which is just, I think, a great kindness on the part of Jesus that he didn't, like, wait till he left to, like, let them have a trial run. He's like, okay, the teacher is still here. This is like when you're, like, again, this idea of being an apprentice, he said, okay, I've trained you. You've been watching me do it. You've been hearing me teach for a while. You go try and come back and tell me how it goes. And they're going to do this. We're going to see this as Mark unfolds. They're going to practice a few times and they're going to get it right and they're going to get it wrong. So there's comfort for us as well, I think, in this. That Jesus, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you are an apprentice of Jesus, one who is coming behind Jesus like we talked a few, about a few weeks ago, if you are coming behind Jesus to learn and observe and see how he acts, what he says, what he does, who he is, and that's what we're doing, hopefully, as disciples, as apprentices of Jesus. We're following behind Jesus so that we can be like Jesus in our unique context. Each of you is going to come into contact with people that I'm not going to come into contact with and vice versa. We all have different spheres of influence. We all have different callings. We all have different vocations in this world that really, really, really require of us to be a true apprentice of Jesus if we're going to be someone who's filled with hope in those places and in those conversations and in those relationships. So Jesus says, hey, I want you to come. I'm gonna, you're going to teach. You're going to be with me, and I'm going to send you out to preach some more. You're going to cast out demons. You're going to break through systems of sin. You're going to break through systems of oppression that have bound up people for a long time in my name, not through your own power. And then that's, what, that's why you're here. It's not just so I can have a band of, like, 12 friends so, like, we can, like, do stuff together, right? Like, woo. No, it's so that I can train you so that you can then be unleashed in the world. And that's what they do. And that's what they do. And here we go. Mark kind of just slapped some stories together here, and so it feels a little disjointed. So I don't have like a nice fancy transition to get us into the next story where Jesus' family thinks he has lost his mind. Literally, did you, did you catch that? They, <laughs> they literally like, we're so sorry, everyone. We're just going to take him home with us. Don't mind us. Like that's, that's the sentiment here, right? Now think about that. Jesus, his, we're told his, his mother... Um, and his brothers, so his, his, his brothers, people that um, were in his household who knew him, probably people like, like the guy who wrote the book of James probably is, is hanging in there, James, the brother of Jesus. So you get Jesus' siblings and his mom uh, coming to like take him home because he has done lost his mind. <laughs> and they're like, they, they come to fetch him essentially because think about this. Jesus, who grew up with them, little Jesus had little brothers, maybe sisters, and, and they're hanging out. And then all of a sudden, Jesus starts acting real weird. He's, he's got all these new friends, and he's kind of like just traveling around. He's kind of left behind what he was doing, maybe, maybe being a carpenter or something. He was kind of like, peace out on that. New, new thing for me. Going to gonna go live my true life now. Like he kind of leaves behind everything, and he gets these new friends. He's traveling all over the place. He's casting out demons. He's teaching in synagogues. He's doing all these things that, that are not, like, they're like, Jesus, calm down. Like, this is, this is not a good look for you, okay? So they're trying to come get him. 
to take him away. And he's, he's, he's frustrating the religious leaders. So he's got religious leaders on one hand who are like, no, 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 no. He's got his family on the other hand who are like, no, 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 no. And then he gets accused of like being the prince of demons. So this is not a good day for Jesus. Like this is just not a good situation. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, the teachers of the law are like, okay, so you're doing all these things and we don't wanna attribute that to God because that goes against what we think God is going to do in our midst. Here's an answer to that riddle. You're actually possessed by a demon. That's, that's our solution to this problem. And Jesus goes, let's think logically about this, friends. <laughs> it's literally what Jesus does. He's like, let's just process that idea. He goes, if I really were what you say I am, if I'm, if I'm possessed by a demon, then why am I casting out demons? He's like, a house divided against itself will not stand. That makes no logical sense, right? So Jesus just uses, uses literally straight logic to like just destroy their idea. And then he says... Then he says this weird thing about blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, which was in your, your curriculum this week. I hope that made sense. Uh, just this idea of, and here's the deal. I talked to, I, I, an abnormal amount of people are concerned that they've committed this sin. Here's the deal. If you're concerned about it, you're good. <laughs> like, if you're thinking about it, like, don't, you're fine. It's okay. Uh, in your, your curriculum talked about how one of, one of the things that, this, that a lot of people think this means is if, if you take the things of God, and you do not attribute them to God, or you attribute them to darkness, to like what they're doing here, like, oh, the good that you're doing, that's actually a demon, Jesus. We're not, we're, we're gonna say that and not attribute that to God. Like you are blaspheming against the character and the nature of God. Does that make sense? Like you, you are misappropriating, you are misrepresenting the nature of God and the character of God and what God is about. And you're actually not only saying that's not God, you're actually attributing it to the evil forces of this world. That's bad news bears. Like that's bad. That goes all the way back to the Old Testament where we're told in, in the Ten Commandments, hey, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That commandment does not mean do not say bad words. <laughs> Do not curse. That's not what that commandment means. That commandment means represent the name of God well. Represent God's nature and God's character and God's essence, God's name appropriately and rightly in the world. So it's kind of tied to this concept of, hey, if, if you're going to attribute the things of God to the things of evil, that's a really bad move. It's a really bad move. And here's, remember when we studied Revelation last year, we, we came across a few verses that talked about how, do you remember, some of us are like, I'd like to not remember, thank you very much. But do you remember how when we talked about that story where you have the dragon, then you have the two beasts, you got one beast who comes out of the land, one beast who comes out of the sea, right? And we're told that one of those beasts, um, the, the language of it, depending on your translation, is, is different. But it talks about how one of those beasts uh, had tried to, tried to, make itself appear like the lamb. It tried to take the things that it was doing for evil and say, no, this is God. Bad. <laughs> Bad news bears. And you remember one of the resounding themes throughout Revelation? If you didn't study Revelation with us last year, totally fine, because I'm going to tell you. Um, the, one of the resounding themes through Revelation is, hey, this calls for wisdom. What we're learning here calls for us to have wisdom. And good news, if you're like, I don't have a lot of wisdom, the Bible also tells us, hey, ask God for wisdom and God will begin to give it to you through the Spirit. Sit with God, sit with Jesus long enough and you will begin to receive wisdom. But this calls for wisdom because here's what the world is wanting us to do. The world is wanting us to kind of say, oh, this is going really well or this is going really bad and then attribute it to things either that aren't God when we should attribute things to God or to misrepresent God by putting things on God that are not of God. And that calls for wisdom. That calls for us to be wise. That calls for us to actually know what God is like. And good news, if you wanna know what God is like, look at Jesus. That is one of the greatest truths of the New Testament. That is the greatest truth of the New Testament, really, because that really is the gospel kind of boiled down and distilled, is that God is like Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If we want to be filled with wisdom to kind of discern this and to discern what Jesus talks about in just a few verses where he says, hey, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister, is my family. Doing the will of God requires wisdom. It requires us to have wisdom to know what God is like. Again, God is like Jesus. It requires us to have wisdom situationally. Again, God will give that to you. 
But to be in the family of God, which Jesus is kind of ultimately going to land the plane at here and say, hey, whoever does God's will, whoever recognizes what God is doing and steps into it, is my family. And I think all of us would be like, I would like to be in your family. That sounds great. But just like we read about in Revelation, or just like we read about through the whole scriptures really, wisdom is required. Wisdom is required. Why? Because we want to accurately understand and then represent God. Just like Jesus did. Because Jesus is God. I can't say that enough. You guys are like, you say that a lot. You can't imagine how many conversations I have where I have to actually like correct that train of thought. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. So why this, this passage? And we're gonna, I'm wrapping this up here. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're landing the plane. Why this passage? Jesus is reminding us, hey, pay attention. I'm like David. I'm doing something new. I'm going to do stuff on the Sabbath that is good. I'm not doing stuff on the Sabbath that's bad. I'm doing stuff on the Sabbath that is good, that is healing, that is purposeful, that is actually bringing life, not death. I'm doing something new. Pay attention. You want to be my family? Do the will of God. Have wisdom. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. We need those new wineskins to contain and understand the new things that God is doing through Jesus. This is, this is important. Remember, we're appointed just like the 12 were. I mean, we're not the 12, right? But we, we carry the same message. You can read to the end of Matthew. We get the Great Commission. We're called to what? Go, preach, do all these things, right? So as you read through the rest of Mark or you read through your next thing this coming week, pay attention to what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus saying? Do you see the disciples saying or doing anything along with that? And what is Jesus doing, and this is a prayer for all of us, that might ask us, to have some new wineskins, to have some new ways of thinking about God, just like the Jews of the day did. Because we still have our own ideas that need to be kind of broken down, and that's hard. But here's good news. God is in the business of doing that. God is in the business of meeting us in those places. Let's pray. God, thank you for being present with us. Jesus, thank you for accurately and continually Um, revealing God to us. We want to know what God is like so that we can know God first and foremost, but so that when then we can accurately tell people about God. So God, we're grateful that we have Jesus to do that. We have the Holy Spirit even with us as we speak right now. Would you bless us as we go to our small groups? God, we love you and we trust you. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen.